Hey friends, Elizabeth here from Plant Based Bride, back again with another video. And today I am wrapping up my August reads, sharing my thoughts and feelings with you, some stats. So get settled in, grab a cup of coffee or tea and hang out with me or use me as a podcast while you get stuff done. Today's video is kindly sponsored by Ana Luisa. Y'all know I'm an Ana Luisa partner and have worked with them for a couple of years now, and I absolutely love what they're doing as a company. Y'all know how important sustainability is to me. Though I'm definitely not perfect, I try to support sustainable companies whenever and wherever I can. And my absolute favorite thing about Ana Luisa is their commitment to sustainability. Ana Luisa is a New York-based jewelry brand with a focus on creating jewelry using low impact and and recycled materials. They are also an ethical company, meaning those who work for Ana Luisa are treated well and paid fairly. The gold used in Ana Luisa's jewelry is 100% recycled from previously worn jewelry. I love that Ana Luisa doesn't contribute to new mining of gold, but instead gives the plentiful gold that already exists a brand new life. I'm going to share with you a couple facts about gold mining that you might not know just to really drive home how important it is that Ana Luisa recycles gold instead of contributing to gold mining. It takes 20 tons of earth mining to produce a single ring of gold. Every 42 seconds, gold mining produces the weight of the Eiffel Tower in waste. The waste produced from gold mining carries mercury and cyanide, which are often released into the water and can be carried a long way from their starting point and can continue to affect marine ecosystems for years to come. I love what Ana Luisa stands for. I love that they are carbon neutral and that they are constantly rethinking ways to be more eco-friendly and more sustainable sustainable in their practices. I wear my Ana Luisa jewelry every single day. Every piece I wear, other than my engagement ring and my wedding ring, are from Ana Luisa. Use the link in my description box to shop pieces starting at $39 from Ana Luisa. And use my code ELIZABETHT10 for 10% off. I'm sure you'll love your Ana Luisa pieces as much as I do. Thank you so much to Ana Luisa for sponsoring this video. As always, there are chapters to this video, so you can skip around if you want. But first, let's talk about my August reading stats. So in August, I finished seven books, totaling 2,285 pages read. The longest book was The Night Circus, and the shortest was Ace, What Asexuality Reveals About Desire, Society, and the Meaning of Sex. And I had zero DNFs. For age demographics, 42.9% were adult, and 57.1% were YA. As for genre, two of the books I read were fantasy, two were nonfiction, one was contemporary, one was romance, and one was science fiction. In terms of format, 62.5% were audiobooks, 25% were physical books, and 12.5% were ebooks. On to my ratings this month. This was honestly really surprising to me, but now that I look back, uh, it's obvious. But I loved the books I finished in August. I gave six books five stars and one book four stars. Has this ever happened to me before? I don't think so. So I apologize to any of you who are especially fond of my rants when I dislike a book because there are no rants incoming. I liked everything I read. As for LGBTQI plus representation in the books I read in August, 71.4% had representation and 28.6% did not. Three were published in 2021, three in 2020, and one in 2011. 28.6% I owned a physical copy, 28.6% I got from my library, and 14.3% were from NetGalley, Scribd, and Libro FM, respectively. As for the author's identities, 57.1% were white, 28.6% were East Asian, and 14.3% were Black. And all of the authors I read from this month were women. As for the nationality of the authors, most of them were American, six out of the seven were American, and one was Canadian. This was not my best month for reading across the world, so I'm definitely going to have have to pay attention to this in September and make sure that I broaden my scope a little bit. So those are all the stats that I collected for my reading in August, and now it's time to jump in and talk about each book individually. The first book I finished in August was The Ones We're Meant to Find by Joan He. The Ones We're Meant to Find is a sci-fi young adult novel focusing on a pair of sisters who have been separated by mysterious means. This book takes place in a future where climate change has drastically altered human life on Earth, and many people live in eco-cities that help to control their environmental impact and protect them from the extreme weather that has been caused by advanced climate change. 
change. And this story explores not only this world, but these two sisters who exist within it. And I loved this book. I gave it five stars. It was so weird and wonderful in exactly the way that I enjoy. The prose was beautiful. It was incredibly mysterious. It took a very long time to pull the different pieces together and kind of figure out what was happening. And I loved that. And there were a couple twists and turns that I didn't see coming that completely shocked me. There are so many layers to this story that you slowly peel back as you read that bring you deeper and deeper into this hazy, dreamlike world where the line between reality and illusion is blurred beyond recognition. I was completely taken in by this book. Within a couple pages, I was hooked and I really enjoyed the process of discovering all of its layers with themes of love and loneliness, happiness and grief, duty and freedom, responsibility and free will, and intent and impact. This book really made me think and also made me feel very deeply. Absolutely gorgeous in its desolation and shrouded in mystery, The Ones We're Meant to Find is definitely worth a read and I highly recommend it. The next book I finished in August was Watch Over Me by Nina LaCour. Watch Over Me is an atmospheric, rural, contemporary ghost story about trauma, grief, survival, loneliness, and healing. This was another one I absolutely adored, and another one that is very hazy and dreamlike, and where it's really difficult to determine reality from illusion. I guess that was kind of a theme throughout my reads in August, and it just reinforces for me how much I love stories like this. And I know this isn't universal. I know there are many people who do not enjoy hazy, dreamlike, weird stories that aren't straightforward, but I love them. So what can you do? I found Watch Over Me to be a heart wrenchingly beautiful read. I immediately emotionally connected to it and to multiple of the characters. It explores some really difficult themes and it was really emotional to read and I definitely felt that through every page. This is a very slow paced, bleak read. So I would definitely recommend making sure you're in the right headspace for a book like this before you jump in and check out trigger content warnings as always. I really loved how the entire book just felt like it was covered in a dense fog. I would definitely recommend this one. I thought it was so beautifully written and an immersive experience to read. The next book I finished in August was She Drives Me Crazy by Kelly Quinlan. This is a YA contemporary enemies to lovers romance between a basketball player and a cheerleader, and it is a lesbian relationship, and I adored it. This book had no right to make me as emotional as it did, okay? I am a 29 year old woman. When I finished this book, I was still 28, but that makes no difference. And I was so wrecked emotionally by this book. It just isn't fair. Like this is a story about two girls in high school falling in love, dealing with coming out, dealing with heartbreak and struggling with lesbophobia and expectations from their parents. And I didn't think it would impact me that deeply because again, it's YA, these are teenagers. And the older I get, the more distance I feel between myself and teenager protagonists. And as much as I still enjoy YA, I still continue to read it. I always have a bit of an expectation at the back of my mind that it's not not going to quite resonate because there just is that separation. You know, I'm more than a decade older than these characters. That time in my life feels quite removed from where I am now. But gosh darn it, this book just destroyed me. <laughs> I was so attached to the characters. I was so attached to the story. I was totally drawn in. I cried a bajillion times. I loved everything about it. It was just wonderful. And it's not like I went into it thinking I wouldn't love it, but it just blew me away. It really exceeded my expectations. The next book I finished in August was Ace, What Asexuality Reveals About Desire, Society, and the Meaning of Sex by Angela Chen. And Ace is a work of nonfiction that not only explores the author's experience coming to terms with her asexuality and kind of figuring out where asexuality fits within her life or how she fits within the definition of asexuality, as well as her interviews with many other asexual people to get a wide array of experiences from the community. And I don't know if this was the intention, but it almost felt like a guide for allosexuals for helping us understand Understand what asexuality is. And I've seen some negative reviews from those within the community, and I of course always want to respect the opinions of those who are of the community that 
the book is addressing. These are own voices reviewers and their opinions are important. But they were having a visceral negative reaction to some of the content of the book. And the book does touch quite a bit on sex as kind of part of the narrative of not only exploring Angela Chen's experience of asexuality and her relationship to sex, but also asexuality in general and how varied asexual people can be in terms of their relationship to sex and whether they're repulsed, whether they are willing to participate, whether they enjoy it. There's quite a spectrum within asexuality. So I saw some reviews from asexual people who were really upset by how sex was talked about in the book or the fact that it was talked about in the book. There were, you know, several asexual people whose reviews I saw who really did not have a good experience reading this book. So if you yourself are asexual and you're considering reading this one, please check out Own Voices reviewers across the spectrum of ratings. Of course, there were also asexual people who adored this book and people in the middle. But protect yourself, protect your mental health, and check out those reviews before you read it. Looking at it as an allosexual person and from the perspective of this being a book trying to teach allosexual people about asexuality, I enjoyed it and I would recommend it in that capacity. But again, I cannot speak for the asexual experience or what it would be like to read this book as an asexual person. From my perspective, I found this book very informative. It answered a lot of questions that I've had about asexuality but haven't necessarily had someone to ask. I will say there are some moments that got me quite defensive in sort of the way that the author tends to generalize allosexual people and how sexuality works for us. And I think some of that comes from the fact that the author herself is not allosexual, so her understanding of sexual attraction that allosexual people feel is a intellectual or an academic understanding, just like allosexual people's understanding of asexuality is on a more academic level rather than a core understanding of what that experience is like. I did have moments where I felt like the way that allosexual people were being defined or being categorized was quite general and not necessarily accurate for myself and for many allosexual people that I know. And there was a bit of a negative connotation there, more often than not that, again, made me feel a little defensive. And I understand that this is coming from the perspective of an asexual person and that asexual people are living in a world that is not set up for them and prioritizes allosexual people's experiences and needs. And that must be incredibly frustrating and difficult to live through. But I did find that some of the categorizations of allosexual people were inaccurate in my experience and, again, had that tinge of negativity that I felt maybe didn't have to be there. And I also felt like the author shared maybe a few too many personal anecdotes that felt like they were going into the oversharing side of things, especially as I went into this not expecting a memoir or something about the author specifically, but something about asexuality as a concept and about a variety of asexual people's experiences, but not necessarily focused on one specific person's in-depth experiences with sex and feelings about sex. And there were definitely moments where I felt like maybe I didn't need to know this about the author, but it is what it is. There were also some repetitive parts of the book which are helpful if you are brand new to learning about asexuality and really need it hammered home. But for anyone who's kind of existed in LGBTQI plus spaces or has sought out the experiences of people from the asexual community specifically, those repetitions started to make the book drag. Still, I found this book very informative and I really, really loved the way that Angela Chen was talking about platonic relationships and the importance of friendships, because that's something that I definitely feel very passionately about. Even as an allosexual person, I am very attached to friendships, and I think relationships with friends can be just as important, if not more important, than relationships with romantic partners. And the fact that our society doesn't really emphasize that or highlight that, that there isn't the same space or compassion provided when a platonic relationship is lost rather than a romantic one. That's something that's always been difficult for me to process, and I really enjoyed hearing the perspective of asexual people on this subject because their experience of having a romantic or sexual partner is so different from my own, but that their perspective on friendships and platonic relationships is actually very aligned with my own. So I really enjoyed that part of it. I would definitely recommend it if you're wanting to learn more about asexuality. The next book I finished in August was our book club selection 
selection for August, which was The Night Circus by Erin Morgenstern. And The Night Circus is a fantasy novel about Le Cirque des Rêves, which is a fantastical, magical circus that you can only attend at night. And I don't want to say too much because I don't want to give away any of the surprises or twists or turns. This book has a lot of those and every single one was wonderful in my opinion, so I don't want to take away any of those surprises for you. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend. I gave it five stars. It was so beautifully written. Just Erin Morgenstern, I've read a previous novel by the author, The Starless Sea, and Morgenstern's use of the English language is just next level stunning. Some of the most lyrical and intricate writing that I've read in a while that I just love existing in. I love surrounding myself with Morgan Stern's words. They're just chef's kiss. So good. And I loved the characters in this one. I think personally, at least as far as I remember The Starless Sea, I think I prefer The Night Circus. And I think the main reason for that is the characters in The Night Circus are just so special. <laughs> I feel so attached to so many of them and I wish, 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 wish that I could meet them and be part of their lives because so many of them are just incredible. And of course the circus itself. I think one of the greatest tragedies of my life is that I will never be able to visit the Cirque des Rêves except in my imagination, which is just so upsetting because the circus is incredible and every description of a tent or of an aspect of the circus or of a performer within the circus was so detailed and intricate and lively that it jumped off the page and it felt like I was experiencing it firsthand. It felt like a movie playing behind my eyelids or in the back of my brain, which isn't normally what happens when I read books. So I was just blown away by this. I adored it. I thought it was so stunning. And I know it's not everyone's favorite. I know it doesn't work for some people, just like The Starless Sea, I think didn't work for a lot of people. One of the biggest criticisms I've seen is that it's plotless, which is not true. Both The Starless Sea and The Night Circus have plots, but the books aren't as focused on the plot as maybe another book might be. This book is about the world that has been built and getting to exist within it, if only for one night. And it's about the characters, the people who populate this world, not as much about the plot. So yes, five stars. Loved it. A new favorite. Probably should have been holding it up this whole time. <laughs> I will definitely reread this probably many times. I have lots of flags for my favorite parts, my favorite quotes, passages that really stood out to me. I just loved it. If you tend to agree with me on books that you enjoy in general, if you like things that aren't necessarily plot driven but have really extensive world building and really beautiful lyrical writing, I think you will get a lot out of this book. So yes. Big fan, new favorite. Next up, we have Redemptor by Jordan Afueco. And this is the follow up to Ray Bearer, which was one of my favorite books of 2020. It is a young adult fantasy focused on our protagonist, Terry Sai, who is an incredibly complex, flawed, principled, strong, and compassionate young woman who is trying to find her way through the world after her life circumstances have changed drastically. And I feel like I can't say too much because again, this is a sequel and there were a lot of twists and turns in the original story and there are more twists and turns and reveals in the second book. And I really don't want to spoil any of them, especially for any of you who maybe haven't read Ray Bearer yet. And if you haven't, what are you doing? <laughs> read it right now. It's so good. If you're a fan of fantasy, you're going to love this. It is not your average YA fantasy. Let me tell you that. This world that Jordan Afueco has built is so layered and rich in culture. There are so many different cultures and they meld and mix and contrast in so many beautiful ways. Her characters are really wonderful and I just, I got so attached to all of them in the first book and I was just as attached in the second book and there were even more new characters for me to fall in love with, which I'm always a fan of. There was one particular portion of Redemptor that was definitely the highlight of the book for me, which again, I feel like I shouldn't share because I don't want to spoil anything, but Terry Sai goes on a journey and it's harrowing. It is unexpected and it's both terrifying and beautiful and magical and heartwarming and 
horrifying, all mixed into one, and I loved it. Definitely by far my favorite part of this book. And seeing Terry Sai grow as a person and go through some struggles and find the strength within herself to ask for help and to try to move forward as part of a community instead of standing alone and trying to do everything by herself was just really beautiful to read about. And again, if you haven't read Ray Bear, please read it and then read Redemptor. And if you haven't read the sequel yet, please do. It is so worth your time. Five stars for sure. I love this series so much. It's awesome. We've reached the final book that I finished in August, which was Disfigured on Fairy Tales, Disability, and Making Space by Amanda LeDuc. And this was my one Canadian read, <laughs> reppin' for the North. And this is a nonfiction book that focuses on how disability is portrayed in fairy tales and also in modern storytelling and how that impacts how people view disabled people and treat disabled people in the real world outside of these stories. And this was just absolutely fascinating. It took me a very long time to finish it. I feel like I've been reading it for six months or something, which is ridiculous. And that's not the book's fault. It's actually quite short. It is very easy to read. Amanda LeDuc did a great job of compiling all this information into a compulsively readable and understandable format. So it's definitely not the book's fault. I think it was just my brain's fault. <laughs> I've had a lot going on in the last six months, um, not the least of which moving across the country. And I've just, you know, had a lot of trouble sitting down and just focusing, especially on nonfiction. It's just been something that my brain has rebelled against focusing on. But every time I sat down to read this book, I thoroughly enjoyed the experience. I have marked down a bunch of pages. I've highlighted a bunch of passages and quotes and little insights that I felt were really, really eye-opening. And this book in general just really opened my eyes to the way that disability and mental illness is portrayed in the stories that we consume. And in so many ways that disability and mental illness are vilified and used as shorthand to indicate that someone is unworthy or villainous. And the way that that treatment of disabled and mentally ill people within stories translates very directly to people's real lives. And as an able-bodied person, there are so many of these aspects of stories that I just never considered. They never came to me because it's not an experience that I have. I'd never heard anyone talking about the way that Ariel, for example, could impact disabled children watching that movie and how her happy ending involves her becoming able-bodied, having her legs and voice again, how that could impact young disabled people consuming that media. It never occurred to me because it's not part of my life. And while I'm disappointed that it was never something that I thought of, I'm really, really glad that Amanda LeDuc has made this entryway, made this opening into the disabled experience for able-bodied people to learn and to try to understand the experience at least a little bit. And the way that the representation that disabled people have been given in media is harming them and try to combat that and be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And then on another level, the discussion of mental illness is something that I can connect to on a much more personal level as someone who has struggled with mental illness. I could really relate to the portions on mental illness within stories, and I really appreciated the way that Amanda LeDuc approached those chapters and how she held this conversation. She is not only own voices when it comes to disability, but she also is own voices for someone who has struggled with mental illness. And I found everything that she shared about her own life within this book very raw and vulnerable and really made me feel such a deep amount of compassion for her and for what she has gone through and the treatment she has received from able-bodied and non-mentally ill people throughout her life who haven't taken the time to understand someone different from them. And I just felt like this was so, so, so worth putting six months into reading it. It's so informative. It is so eye-opening. If you are a fan of fairy tales, if you love Disney movies, if you love superhero movies, you really need to read this book because so much of those stories hinges on our misunderstanding of disability and mental illness and our inability to view disabled and mentally ill people as whole, complete people worthy of community support and worthy of happy endings. And that needs to change. So I highly, highly recommend Disfigured. Please pick it up. It is really, really eye-opening. 
So those are all the books that I finished in August. I hope you enjoyed this little wrap up video. As always, please leave your suggestions, recommendations for books in the comments down below and let me know your thoughts if you've read any of the books that I talked about in this video. I want to take a moment to thank my patrons for their support. Extra special thanks to our newest patrons, Keegan, Daniela, Estelle, Diana, Anna, Amanda, Sabine, Emma, Lilia, Leslie, Lisa, and Shanice. Welcome all of you to the squad. We are so excited to have you. If you at home want to join the squad, feel free. There's a link in the card and in the description box down below. You can also join our book club through Patreon if you are interested. This month we are reading Clara and the Sun by Kazuo Ishiguro. And yeah, that's it for this video. Thank you so much to Ana Luisa for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to use the link in my description box to shop Ana Luisa and use my code Elizabeth T10 for 10% off. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you really soon in my next one. Bye friends.